This is the Magician and the Fool podcast, episode number 65. My name is Dominic. I'm one of the co-hosts. The other co-host's name is Janus, and you will hear from him shortly. Today we speak to returning guest, Mr. Nicholas Shrek, for our annual Halloween dose of existential dread. Love him or hate him, Nicholas always provides with a very entertaining and insightful interview. We're always happy to have him back, and this episode did not disappoint. Before we get started, I just want to say thanks to all of our Patreon supporters. As always, we really appreciate you. Um, You make this show possible without your support. Um, It would be much more difficult to keep things running, keep the lights on, and pay the bills associated with the podcast. So, if you would like to help support us and partner with us on this journey feel free to head over to patreon check us out and help however you feel is right for you you'll have to excuse my voice in this episode i am just getting over some kind of cold we dedicate this to hermes and asclepius and may any merits that we accumulate doing this work be distributed to all sentient beings so that they together with us may equally realize awakening Welcome to the show. Um, Today we are pleased to have a returning guest back, the amazing and always interesting Mr. Nicholas Shrek. Welcome back to the show, Nicholas. Welcome, Nicholas. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you both for inviting me. I will try to live up to my amazing and interesting reputation the best I can. (laughs) I know you will. You always do. We're always excited to have Nicholas on the show, and it's it's always it's always a hit with our listeners. You know, people want to hear what you have to say. Let's face it. Well, let's get started. Where shall we begin, gentlemen? Well, let's begin with where you are located currently. So, right now, you are in Athens. So, let's let's hear about what's going on there. I am in Athens, Greece, where I am teaching, uh, as I do, Vajrayana. Uh, Buddhism and mysticism and magic. And yeah, very often I go where my students are. So I am in Athens, Greece, but in a very interesting phase in my life when I'm beginning a very major cycle of work. Not that I haven't been a workaholic for quite some time, but this is moving into a whole other area, which will soon be evident. By coming to Athens, I am reconnecting to the very beginning of my initiation, which as a very young child, and I think I've discussed this on the show, was this encounter with the Venus de Milo, with the, with the statue of Aphrodite. And that was my first encounter with the presence and intelligence of a goddess or of a deity. And that immediately triggered in my very early childhood this deep memory fascination with the gods of Olympus. And so my connection to the gods and goddesses, the lore and mythology of the ancient Hellenic world was really what drew me in to the initiatory path. As early, It's my earliest memories. I was gifted with a book by my father, who was also very interested in Greek mythology. And it was a book called Dallaire's Greek myths, and it was an illustrated compendium of all of the ancient Greek myths, and I studied it with incredible dedication and diligence beyond what a 
a sane child would do. And I was very aware, even at that very early age, that ancient Greece was where I came from. And the modern American world of the 60s that I found myself in, I looked at as some kind of alien nightmare. And some of my first thoughts were, how the hell did I get here? This is the wrong place. Mm. So if you think that, obviously that is a continuum coming from another life. And I was very aware of that. So, so in coming, in short, in coming back to Greece at this moment in my life, I'm very much reconnecting to the very roots of my initiation, particularly the worship of the goddess Aphrodite, but to the entire Hellenic lore. And also the ancient Greek philosopher Empodocles is a very great influence on my initiation. So, yeah, so not only am I here teaching Vajrayana, but also on a personal level, reconnecting to the gods and goddesses of Olympus. And as we're sitting here, as we're sitting here, I literally hear the ocean waves rolling out there. I mean, that's how close I am. The moon is shining into my room. It could not be more filled with Hellenic magic. So I hope some of that will radiate to you and your listeners. That's amazing. Any any specific and special encounters or or things that you've experienced on this recent trip? Not really. It has been pretty intensively me teaching. Yeah, um, okay. Tomorrow, tomorrow I will have more of a chance to explore on my own. But you know, te- teaching in this environment, I can say right now. In Greece, you feel a depth and a, a, um, a wave of tradition coming from the ancient world that you do not feel in other countries. The only other place I have felt it so strongly is in Italy. You feel how old it is, how ancient, and you can feel that in the air here. And that even inspires me as a teacher. And I think I'm I'm more directly connected to whatever karmic force brought me into this world, which clearly had something to do with ancient Greece. It's like you're coming back into connection with the mind stream you had from the past incarnation. I feel that very strongly. Yes, I'm very aware of it, even at this very moment, as a very visceral thing. I'm connecting to somehow, I know this is not where I lived in my last life. I know that that was Germany, where I returned. But I know that this, that ancient Hellenic culture, uh, you know, definitely was a crucial part of my early initiation at some point. So yes, I, I'm reconnecting to that part of my mind stream, rejuvenating, restoring, and preparing, as I said, for a great deal of very arduous and, and pretty ambitious work that is coming up in the next year. So in terms of students, let's talk a little bit more about that, because you consistently teach and mm-hmm. You know, there are dynamics to teacher-student re- relationships. There are psychic aspects to teacher-student relationships. There's also ethical considerations. And today, in today's world of you know pundits and hacks and imbeciles walking backwards on balls in the street with snake mm-hmm. oil in their hands that they're juggling, we have a lot of you know we have a lot of fool's gold. And so I was wondering if you might be willing to discourse a little on the nature of a genuine teacher relationship, teacher student relationship, that exchange and the different dimensions that are attendant upon it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it's very important to do so for several reasons. As you say, because of the fool's gold of how many fake charlatans and phonies and or even people who are connected to legitimate traditions that that end up corrupt or or tainting or staining that tradition through unethical behavior of which there are unfortunately countless examples and of and even in western culture the word guru has become an insult largely you know like you're you're being too deferential you're being too devoted to someone what is that your guru or something so, and especially since the 60s and the kind of dumbing down of the guru concept from the original Eastern idea, guru has almost become a prerogative, you know, a pejorative insult. 
And that, frankly, is because so many teachers have abused their power, abused their, the trust that their students give them. How do you determine whether somebody is authentically trustworthy, reliable, and can convey true initiatory wisdom and knowledge? Ultimately, first of all, a true student-teacher relationship is it's not like learning scuba diving or French cooking or photography where any competent person can show you the basics. The question is, what, what does a, a spiritual teacher, at least in my tradition, is teaching you how to become liberated from this cycle of samsara altogether? So it's not like I'm uh, any any decent spiritual teacher is not just providing information that you could get in a book. You therefore you require the foundation of a deep karmic connection between teacher and student, and that is the that is the medium through which the teaching travels. And because of that, for instance, in this teaching that I'm giving, as much of the teaching is my mere physical presence with students who also have a karmic resonance with me, and I have one with them, that is the necessary spark that, that creates the fire of the student-teacher relationship. You, you can't just be a genetic, it's not like, oh, okay, I'll teach you this information and you learn it. It's a very deep relationship that is maybe the deepest kind of relationship there could be. Because And, and I have to say that, for instance, I think maybe people have a wrong idea of what a what a Vajrayana teacher does. I don't think that this student of mine will mind if I mention yesterday I had to guide her all of a sudden in the middle of my doing something else uh, in how to guide her mother in dying. Her mother was literally dying and she was in the hospital room and I guided her as much as I could from a distance. And that is very often the kind of deep personal relationship that a true spiritual teacher has. And and the point is, that's not about, I think people think, or secular people think that spiritual teachers are imposing their ego, uh, having this great desire to be followed, because that's how they see it. From their egotistical point of view, they think it would they would enjoy being an authority. But that's not what it is. You are giving of yourself completely to the student. You are there for them sometimes in their darkest hour. For instance, the death of a parent. Sure, sure. And I've, I've heard that from my own teacher in, in the Buddhist lineage that um, becoming ordained is actually quite a burden. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily a fun experience all the time because you are taking the weight of of your students and the community, if there's a congregation, you're you're taking that all onto your shoulders, and it's it's quite a bit of responsibility. Right. Well, I don't I don't want to bitch about it as sure. if it it is a joy, and it, there is no more sacred honor than to to guide people to full awakening and liberation. Sure. So it is a great honor to do it and a pleasure to do it. However, you you have to be completely honest when you are having a spiritual teacher-student relationship. The student must be 100% honest, and the teacher must be 100% honest in a way that is radically different than the usual prevarication and white lies and mm -hmm. diplomacy that informs most human relationships, right? So... This, this radical honesty that's required means that, that I hear the darkest secrets of people and I protect them with my life. I would never repeat them. But you do get a very jaundiced picture of humanity because when your students are being totally honest with you and speaking from the heart about the ways that their mind was shaped and their lives were shaped, you start to see how much suffering there is from families, from friends, from relationships, how cruel people are, how much neglect there is, how much lack of kindness there is. And I experienced death and illness a great deal. I experienced the deaths of 
you know, sometimes guiding my students to their death. I have done that as well. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's it is a joyful burden, but that is the initiatory process. It is, you know, we should never think modern people are very hedonistic and assume that life will be pleasant and that everything will be pleasurable. But it's true initiation should be painful because it should face you with your own neuroses, with your own obstacles. And it it's it's a very it's a very arduous task to for the initiate as well and for the student, because you're working to dismantle your ego and you're working against yourself to vanquish your own enemy and you are your own enemy. So that is a very that can become a very dark, painful process, and it can lead to the dark night of the soul. The problem with a lot of how spiritual teachers present, or, or I should say market, what they teach in a very new age, dumbed down way, again, to use that phrase, as if it's all going to be joyful, it's all going to be pleasant, it's all going to be good vibes only. And that is why a guru, the word in Sanskrit, as you probably know, means heavy. And, not, and, and heavy means it has to be somebody strong enough to guide you through the darkness of your own mind and of the spiritual pitfalls that you will face on a genuine spiritual path to the true light, to the true reality, to the true awakening. So, Nicholas, um, being that you have such experience in the Western occult and esoteric world, as well as this Vajrayana path that you're a part of, I, I was having a conversation recently with a good friend who is a Western esotericist, I guess, for lack of better better term. And we were discussing the, or I was I was making the argument for the advantage of of a lineage that you could be a part of with something like uh, Buddhism. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the importance of lineage? I mean, is it necessary? Anything you have to say on that would be interesting to me. Yeah, uh, it is, that is of fundamental importance to my own personal initiation. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and directing the answer to what, to your prelude about Western occultism, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. Um, I rejected Western occultism after studying it and being a part of it and meeting most of the major figures in it. The problem with Western occultism is exactly what you're saying. It, it has no lineage. It has no connecting link to an authentic tradition. That, that This do-it-yourself initiatory process, which Westerners are attracted to because of their supposed individualism their uh, dislike of authority, their wanting to, to test things for themselves rather than take things on, on traditional value. That is the problem with Western occultism, and that's why I rejected it. And one of the, one of the things I'm working on, on and off when I have a chance, is a, is a book about how the Western occult tradition, and we have discussed this a little bit in the past, the Western occult tradition as we know it, that is so lauded and such a sacred cow, almost all of it is based on some sort of fraudulence. All of Madame Blavatsky's works, or most of them we now know, like the Secret Doctrine, were plagiarized. She was basically operating like a cheap spiritualist, you know, like a gypsy fortune teller of the 19th century uh, with fake messages from the secret chiefs. And basically, she was a fraud. She was a con woman, literally fake seance kind of mumbo jumbo, where she's pretending to get messages from the secret chiefs, and they are pre-written messages that she would write herself. So in, in short, the problem is Western occultism doesn't have a reliable lineage. So, I mean, we could go through each of them, but I, I honestly can't think of a single Western esoteric path that is legitimate. Wicca, most paganism is based on very sketchy sources. You know, the, the entire, the, all of these orders that are based on Rosicrucian and Freemasonic models, with degrees, all of them, What what is the basis of them? You know, it's very difficult to find 
an actual lineage. So yes, I absolutely. Now in my case, I made a deliberate decision. I can no longer be a part of this do-it-yourself occultism. And I, I genuinely sought a, a traditional lineage, in very much inspired by René Guénon and traditionalism, which I always felt an affinity with, and his concept of counter-initiation, which we have discussed in previous conversations. Um, so I have to make it clear that despite my reputation, I reject Western occultism entirely. I don't know of any part of it that is valid. There are talented magicians who have a certain elemental power and are able to be decent magicians because of some karmic seed that they have that is developed. But I don't think it has much to do with any of these orders or organizations whatsoever, which mostly seem to me to stifle initiatory progress. And in that sense, as René Guénon said, are counter-initiatory. So, my, so because of that, on, in my own personal quest, although I was always drawn to the Karmakaju school of Tantric Buddhism, even from a very young age, I first looked at Sufism when I, when I got out of the Western occult path, because Sufism clearly is based on a lineage from sheikh to sheikh to sheikh, going back to you know primordial times. And I ultimately rejected Sufism for several reasons. One, that I absolutely know that monotheism is not true. There is not one God. And, you know, there were several other reasons, but I did find Sufism, if there is an authentic spiritual tradition, I would recommend Sufism as being one that is reliable, trustworthy, and that actually leads to real initiatory progress and significant effects that can be noticed that is not just imaginary and theoretical. And when I rejected Sufism, then I turned to Vajrayana Buddhism. And in, in Vajrayana Buddhism, of course, the guru, the lama, is crucially important that the teacher has an authentic lineage that, that is connected to their teacher. So, for instance, I know the lineage of my late teacher, Changu Rinpoche. His teacher was the 16th Karmapa, etc., etc. And it goes on all the way, can be traced without any break in the chain to Shakyamuni Buddha and Vajradhara. So that that is crucially important to me. I, I believe, and also Buddhism, Tantric Buddhism particularly, but all sects of Buddhism and schools of Dharma are not interested in converting people or convincing people or persuading. So I say this as my personal opinion, not, yeah. I, I respect the spiritual traditions of all other people, I am friends with Muslims, Kabbalists, Catholics, Gnostics, pagans. If if they are doing something that seems to me authentic and connected to something real, if they're fantasizing and in some kind of bullshit game, then I then I reject it. But I have friends and associates and students from every kind of spiritual tradition. So when I say this, it's my own sure. experience and perspective. I believe that the techniques, the methods, the that Vajrayana Buddhism teaches are the only way to attain full liberation from suffering and from the eternal cycle of samsara. I, and, and when you take the vows to become a tantric Buddhist, you have to, they are called refuge, because you're basically saying the only refuge there is, is the teaching of the Dharma. And I have found that to be true. I the actual changes, the transformations in my own life, in my own mind, have just been tremendous. They are they are clearly noticeable. They are visceral. There's no doubt about them. You don't have to fantasize or project about them. Mm -hmm. And and it's not it's not a belief system. It is based on practice, particularly the Karmakaju, the school that I am initiated in, is known to be focused mostly on practice not on theory so yes to answer briefly in my opinion the tantric system is the way to full liberation i also believe that the that to the degree that we can understand what is mis 
diagnosed as Gnosticism, is another way to liberation. I believe there are many similarities between it and Tantric Buddhism, to the point, having studied both of them in great depth, I believe that they are both looking at the same metaphysical issues from a Middle Eastern and an Asian perspective. But I think I think that Gnosticism is the other system that is authentic. Now, unfortunately, the problem with that, and this I have written about it a great deal in this book about Abraxas that will be coming out shortly, um, is that there is no direct lineage of teachers in Gnosticism. And Janice, you can certainly speak on that topic. Yeah, well, unfortunately, the Romanists exterminated most of the Gnostics of, you know, a couple thousand years ago. And then what did survive? There was survive. There were survivals. They did go underground, which is why there was the brutal Holocaust of the Cathars, because that was one survival. And there were survivals in the Middle East, which is what the Templars came into contact with. But generally speaking, though there is a survival of a Gnostic transmission, it is mostly occulted and clandestine and not accessible to everyday people. I understand that there's a egalitarian democratization of information on the internet, which encourages people be- to believe that everything should be for everyone and everyone has the same proclivities, capabilities, and entitlements. But unfortunately, that isn't the reality. The Gnosis does find the souls whom it's destined for because it is part of those souls and those souls are a part of it. So I would say on the one hand, there's no continuous transmission, but on the other hand, there the Gnosis still lives and the and, and the spiritual transmission is available to to those souls that are truly uh, gnostic souls i guess you could say so i would my personal opinion that if if someone is ready to reject western occultism and its vague sort of do it yourself make believe lineages the three traditions which seem to me valid although absolutely i have i don't hide my bias or prejudice that tantric buddhism is the absolutely correct one that will lead one to liberation i would say that sufism and gnosticism are both paths that are legitimate okay interesting and and you did bring up a, a lot of probably controversial but that's nothing new for you uh controversial points and uh really fascinating thoughts on that and i'm curious well we can we can go back to them if you know we we can digress we can return to i want to move yeah yeah sorry sorry to talk over you i i did want to move on to uh Abrasax or abraxas here in a second but i was curious because we just had a, an episode, I think the name of the episode prior to yours was The Legacy of Western Esotericism, and we were just talking about the uh, broken yet somewhat, uh, how, how would I say, the broken lineage of the Western esoteric tradition, but that there is there is a thread that is able to connect them, you know, from Egypt to the Platonists to the Renaissance, you know, and, and forward. And so I'm curious what what Janus has to say, given um, what we've talked about in the past, um, pertaining to the points you've made. Okay, so let, let me elaborate. All right, so let me elaborate on that a touch. Nicholas's criticisms are absolutely valid, and I would say that for much of the Western esoteric movement, they hold. I would only add that there are legitimate genuine lineages in the Western esoteric tradition, but they're underground. And Nicholas and I have discussed this. They're underground. They're silent. They don't advertise themselves. They're usually initiation or invitation only. And the people involved in them are quite literally doing magical and esoteric work constantly. It's almost like they're in personal monasteries. These are people who aren't doing it for um, a fashion show you know, hot topic occultism. They're do, they, these are people who are working together very quietly along very specific lines to achieve very specific mystical and initiatic goals. In the last episode, we discussed a group called the Elu Cohen, and one of their main goals is to bind demons, especially demons which many modern occultists try and conjure 
and it causes mm-hmm. all kinds of problems. And this group exists specifically almost as a magical police force to try and keep some of the collateral damage from hurting people. But these groups like like the Elu Cohen, they don't, they're not people who are doing, they, they're not people who are doing this for, you know, for fame. They're doing it right. because it needs to be done. And I can speak from firsthand knowledge that these people are putting themselves in danger because these entities will react and they do try and retaliate. And it is dangerous work. And that's one of the reasons this is only an invitation only work because it, it isn't for somebody just listening to a podcast on the internet. Sorry. Well, mo- a great deal of my work, as well as dealing with death and, and illness and things that people don't think of as positive parts of spiritual initiation, is doing exorcism of getting rid of demons that have been conjured by foolish occultists who, for some reason, continue to tamper with the lower elementals that have nothing but malice for humanity. And the amount of damage that that does to their initiation and to the people around them and to their lives is astounding. So I spend a great deal of my work, initiatory work, is compelling demons to leave, banishing them, and exercising them. And this is an important topic because it has become endemic through the internet. Uh, This idea of demonolatry and the idea that the demons are just maligned pagan gods and the or the idea that they're just powers of nature that are misunderstood it's bullshit it's bullshit let me listen to janus friends i'm telling you right now i'm giving you the the straight talk i'm giving you the real deal these these things that they tell you on the internet about these demons it's not true if you want to conjure a pagan god then go to the culture For instance, if you want to get in touch with the Babylonian deity, why would you do that through a demon? You would do that through a Babylonian rite, using Babylonian prayers, using a Babylonian ceremony. Don't listen to these things these people are telling you. These are demons. The whole reason these people say these things is because the demons are leading them to say these things to ensnare you. No, I I agree completely, and I think it's very important that we bring this up, because I'm astonished by how many Western occultists think that that's a completely legitimate thing to do, and that it's helpful, and that demons are in any way, I mean, it's almost idiotic. Uh, Now, in my youth, of course, I experimented with all that myself very deeply, so I'm not speaking from ignorance. I know how damaging they are. I know that possession is real. And working with demons is absolutely suicidal, and it creates grave consequences for everyone in your life, even your pets, actually, even if you care about your own animals. The worst thing you could possibly do is is Congress with demonic entities under any form, in any way, shape, or form. So I agree with you completely, and I think it's very important. I, For instance... I think I need to talk about the practicalities of these things. I recently had to do an exorcism of a jinn with an Arabic student who comes from a Muslim background. And these things are absolutely real. And after I did this exorcism of the jinn, I found some British group, some British occult group that actually was celebrating and seeking contact with jinns. So it is a very real problem and it does need to be policed. And it does, you know, without, without being witch finder general, people who are fooled into believing that demons are helpful initiatory forces are deeply misled. It's, it's as, it's as harmful, for instance, at the very least as having a major drug addiction. I would absolutely, say. Absolutely. It's so funny you say that because I'm not going to name names because I don't want I don't want to be attacked by those sycophants who follow this person, but there was a teacher who worked very hard while he was alive to popularize uh, working closely with goetic demons and spouted a lot of these lies that, you know, we've already repeat discussed in this episode. And mm-hmm. most people don't realize that this person was addicted to crystal meth was on uh, welfare and was 
grievously ill, probably with 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 some kind of disease, um, and lived in squalor. Yeah, and he lived in squalor. He lived in squalor. He lived in filth. I know somebody personally who went to visit him, and he told me that him and his partner literally lived in filthy environment. So that's the kind of person that's saying that these demons can help you and give you all these things. And this is the environment they're living in. And this is the life they're living in. This is one of the leading top, most well-known teachers who right. all the, all the internet occultists worshiped at the, at, at the altar of this, of this, right. of this person. Well, and then, then the excuse they make, for instance, I will name, uh, you know, the, the, the Satanist that I dealt with, they had miserable lives. They lived in squalor and poverty. Uh, they were not successful magicians because you cannot be one if you're working with demons, unless there's some mitigating force in your initiatory techniques that works against them, which is what I believe happened with me. The fact that even though I was participating in devil worship and the conjuring of demons when I was very young, I was also pursuing other initiatory paths. I think that I can be an effective spiritual teacher because I know how harmful they are. Mm -hmm. And I think pe people think that I'm going to be a little bit gentle about that subject, maybe because of my background, like I'll think it's okay. But on the contrary, I am very severe that you should have nothing to do with demonic forces whatsoever, not even the symbolism of them, mm. you know? So, yes, I, I agree. And the fact is, there is no demon has ever helped anybody for long. And even if they did for a little while, it was only to torment them, to give them a taste of victory and whatever magical goal they sought, only to drag them down and destroy them. So, yeah, we, we are both giving the same exact warning to stay away from any kind of demonic forces. Now, that should be elementary, but as you said, and this is a very important point, and I know secular humanists and atheists will find it hard to believe, but that's because once you start working with them, they possess you and they guide you like a cancer to, they infiltrate your body and your mind and they want to encourage you to let more demons into the mortal world. Well, yeah, and, and karma, mundane karma, on its own, it could be difficult enough to deal with. Um, but to bring in a supernatural, to, for lack of a better word, and chaotic um, entity into your life is creating karmic repercussions that you know are, are just so compounded on, on top of what you would normally be dealing with. Um, and I, I believe very strongly that, that karma is, is kind of a web that makes a lot of this stuff work among other things and to be bringing these forces and these energies into your life is just going to make everything more difficult while it may, it may seem helpful initially or in some circumstances long term it's it's create it's knocking down dominoes that you don't even know exist yeah Absolutely. i can I, I i agree i can give you two metaphors that i use very often that I'm sure my students will roll their eyes at because I've made these warnings to those that tamper with demons. And karmically, it, it's like it's like as if you knew you were letting dangerous criminals out of prison and you were joyfully letting them out and telling them where you can go to rob, rape, kill, and commit more violence and pain and harm. That is exactly what, it, in the human mortal world, that would be the equivalent of conjuring and bringing demons into our world. And second, secondly, another, maybe because I've dealt with so many criminals, the metaphor strikes me to be very accurate. It's like dealing with the mafia or organized crime. As you said, there could be initial advantage, uh, but you're going to find out that the cost of that initial advantage was not worth the little bit of gain you may have received right. it's it's really like that and people you know I, I know a lot of secular humanists i try to deal with those people and i'm amazed by their arrogance oh yeah to be demonically possessed in their denial that demons are real that karma is real 
In fact, I get more pushback and more negative reaction as a tantric Buddhist than I did as a devil worshiper because as a devil worshiper, I wasn't expecting any ethical standards. Mm -hmm. But when you actually, you know, the the reality of being a spiritual teacher, people are intimidated when you are saying, yeah, you do have, you have karma. You are responsible for your own actions. There are consequences to what you do. And there's nothing that people fight with the, the demonic energy of literally the little girl and the exorcist when you bring these things up. And I really wonder if postmodernism and Marxist atheism and just secular humanism in general, including even the kind of Robert Anton Wilson, like chaos magic approach to, well, we don't really know what's true or not, so we can do whatever we want. Mm-hmm. That whole attitude I believe that it is genuinely demonic and what we would call in tantric Buddhism, Maras have infected the minds of people who think like this because their hatred of the idea of karma, their hatred of having an ethical code is astonishing. It's, it's their own religion of non-belief. Absolutely. Absolutely. Janice, did you want to add to that or um, do you guys think, are you guys comfortable moving on to uh, Abraxas at this time? No, I, no. We need, I want to add something to that. So okay. people don't understand a certain distinction also. So possession comes in different gre- degrees. And there's also another term, obsession, which is related to possession. Obsession is a form of possession where the spirit or demon integrates with the person's personality subconsciously influencing them to make decisions in conformity with its strategies. It needs to be understood that possession is not always an outright dramatic exorcist style, head twisting, vomit spitting. No, not, not at all. Not at all. I agree with you. I have had to deal with many more people that are obsessed than possessed. Possessed is the most extreme form of of this demonic infestation and so a lot of the time people and most people because their spiritual senses in their subtle body are not awakened they're not even conscious of what's occurring they might do some little ritual or something think there were no effects go about their day and for years have a, a roommate in their apartment that hasn't been paying hiding in the closet and yes absolutely you know, this... and they don't address this and this can affect the the karmas that they create yes i i agree completely it's very good that we brought this up and i feel i actually feel that spiritual forces guided us to say this because maybe that is the ultimate problem with western occultism that i was talking about earlier is that, in fact, even these illegitimate lineages and fakery, you know, take Madame Blavatsky, L. Ron Hubbard, Crowley, um, many of the fakers and charlatans of Western occultism, and there's many others, many more obscure. Um, ultimately, it is a demonic problem in that this there is nothing more spiritually harmful or more karmically harmful than misleading sincere spiritual searchers into a dead end of demon evocation. And this itself, I believe, is caused by demons. We should, of course, point out that daemon, D-A-I-M-O-N, mm-hmm. was, a, was a neutral, usually positive, informing spiritual force, and that the Christians took the word and made it into demon. Mm-hmm. But now, a problem with that is that some apologists for demons, and this is very demonic, would say, oh, you see, demons are actually good. And I'm sure you've heard that argument from half-informed, pseudo-intelligent occultists that try to redeem or whitewash the demon as the daemon. But speaking here from Athens, those are two very different things. So I think that's, I think that, that we come to an elemental conclusion between the three of us that the very problem with a lot of Western esotericism is it gives free reign to bringing extremely malevolent and negative forces into this world. And lying lying to students, lying to spiritual searchers, 
by pre presenting fakery or charlatanism. A lot of occultists accept that. Oh, well, that was just colorful. They were a showman. That was just part of their magical skill. No, it's, it is demonic to misrepresent spiritual forces. So, Nicholas, this is all very interesting, um, but I, I definitely want to touch on this Abraxas topic. Um, we've mentioned it in previous episodes, but this is like an ongoing subject for you that you've been involved with. Um, recently, you gave a talk in Stockholm, I believe. So let's let's move into that because you're writing a book. Let's talk about Abraxas. My gut feeling of the most important thing to say about Abraxas is, in, in my research into it, in writing this what I hope will be the definitive volume on Abraxas is there is a Sufi saying, the secret protects itself. And despite the fact that there was a time in the ancient world when Abraxas was considered to be the true God of gods by the intelligentsia and, and the highest level of mystagogues and and spiritual teachers in the middle eastern world that it is forgotten and that that the name comes up now and again but usually almost completely wrong it is interesting as i trace in the book that it appears in cultural forms in literature in music in an authentic way but some there's something about abraxas even though i think it is of tremendous if not central significant importance to understanding the very reality that we live in and the nature of the spiritual world that human beings are ensnared in, very few people understand how important it is. And there's something that in itself is a Braxen, mm. uh, sort of like the initiatory groups that Janice was referring to earlier that practice without advertisement and that you don't even know what they're doing. A Braxis is immensely powerful has had a tremendous impact on my own initiation in life and many other people who are connected with me. And yet it, it just doesn't seem to stick with people perhaps because there's no, you know, there's no story, no saga, no mythology as mm -hmm. such that can be identified with, but there's something very mysterious about that, that even though you can find scholarship about Abraxas and you see images of Abraxas and it's used in everything from horror movies to rock songs. People really don't get it. And that, that is a very mystifying thing about it. You know, other gods have been examined and studied thoroughly, but not that one. So that is the work that I've been engaged in for a while since the sort of middle of the pandemic starting. And I gave this lecture in stockholm sweden in august and it itself was filled with synchronicities the more more than i can even describe and it it turned out to be a kind of evocation of abraxas it was basically i read the introduction to my book which is the introduction riffing off of jung is called the eighth sermon of the dead based on jung's idea of the seventh sermon of the dead mm. and the significance of Abraxas spiritually is so huge compared to how little he is known. I think that that's a good place to begin. And we're going to get into synchronicities too. Another thing that I have noticed and almost everybody who has worked with Abraxas, and I think Janice as a Gnostic practitioner himself will, will reflect this or mirror this, is that Abraxas seems to emerge and manifest into our mortal world in synchronicities. That seems to be a language which he speaks to us in. And I'll give you the most recent of hundreds of examples in my life. In, in Berlin, when old analog phone booths are put out of commission, they use them to put libraries in. So they put people will leave there are unwanted books there, and if you, and you can trade, you can leave a book you don't want, and you can take a book. So in Berlin, they have this tradition. And in my neighborhood one day, a few years ago, I found in one of these phone booths that have books in them a vintage, rare, perfect condition copy of Hermann Hesse's 1919 novel, Demian which was published under the pseudonym Emile Sinclair. 
but was written by Hermann Hesse. And Demian, as you and your listeners may know, sort of popularized Abraxas in Germany during the Weimar Republic and really popularized to a certain degree the idea, Jung's concepts from the Red Book about Abraxas, even though they themselves are not completely accurate, and we can get into that a bit. So I found a few years ago this copy of Demian, which is probably the best known book about Abraxas. And I took that as some sort of sign because I was actually asking the cosmos for an answer on something, and that provided the answer. Then recently, in August, shortly before going to give this lecture, um, the, somebody burnt down the phone booth, which was a very dramatic act. In Germany, that kind of thing doesn't happen often. Somebody actually set the phone booth in the middle of the night on fire. Mm. And so all of the books that were in it were like blackened husks. It looked like some kind of surrealism exhibit. And on the on a bench right next to this phone booth, there was one book. And it was, again, this time, an English copy of Demian, wow. which is all about Abraxas. The only book that seemed to survive the fire, and somebody left it right next to the phone booth. And when I found it, a wind was blowing, like in a movie, when, when like in a corny movie, when they're trying to sh show the character, oh, pay attention to this. A wind was blowing it mm -hmm. open and blew it open to the page Demian. So that's <laughs> two two copies of this fairly obscure book that I found. One, a vintage German copy, the original from 1919, and then this one. And this was after I had done this Abraxas. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't before, but I'm sorry, but right after I had done this Abraxas lecture in Sweden upon returning to Berlin. And that seems to be the language of the way that Abraxas communicates to us. So I wondered, Janice, since you have also worked with this deity, what what have you found that to be? Well, a person approaching Abrasax needs to be willing to transcend immersion in and imprisonment by the forces of duality. One thing that I have learned about Abrasax or Abraxas is that this, I don't even know that it's appropriate to call him a god because he's ontologically higher than the quote-unquote gods. But I would say that Abraxas has a power that transcends duality, that transcends the enmity implicit in duality. And so you have to have a non-dual view in order to be able to approach the mystery. Another thing I'd like to say is that it's it was common in Victorian uh, scholarship of Gnosticism, Gnostic gems, things like that, to label Abrasax as a quote unquote solar solar deity or a solar de demiurge or a solar pantheos, and we see that repeated ad nauseum these days. It's not really accurate to to restrict the idea to rest restrict this god this this being, this aeon, this redeemed archon, whatever you want to call him, to being simply one ray of the seven-rayed cosmos, when in fact he's mm -hmm. closely associated with what in the mysteries was called the seven-rayed god. The solar ray, though primary, is still one of those seven rays. Abrasax is far more than a quote-unquote right. solar demiurge. Now, this doesn't get in, this also doesn't get into the fact that there are several demiurges and the demiurge that most people only demiurge that most people know is only the first one who was actually historically disposed and and is, right. was seen even by the time of the early christians was seen as solely the ruler of the earth plane he was no yes. longer seen as the ruler of the cosmos the demiurge that that made the flawed creation and commands the forces of ignorance was understood to have been cast down from his throne and so is we have to deal with him because he rules the earth according to that perspective. But he doesn't necessarily rule rule the whole cosmos. But Abrasax, you know, he's he's constantly at war with those forces. And I think that's an important let me I just to add one more thing. I think that's an important component of Abrasax too, is that this is a god who I wouldn't say is a war god, but he is a god of battle. He is a god of 
of war and he fights the literally fights aggressively with great hostility and justice against the forces of ignorance he's at constant war with the forces of evil and ignorance that has been my experience completely and braxis is the truth and he very aggressively and radically exposes and destroys liars i have seen this to be true he exposes and he actually yeah in a, in a very radical warlike way although he is not a war god but that's because he is fighting the demiurgic delusions of of this material world and furthermore he's not i think adding to this he's not just a god he is the god he is the in this particular cosmos and i don't know if there are others there are other alternate dimensions but as far as i know and as far as i have gone he is the the god of gods he is the ruling force in this dimension in this cosmos if you are seeking the ultimate godhead he is equivalent to what the dharmakaya is in tantric buddhism so that is my personal practice and feeling about abraxas historically speaking i'd like to get both of your thoughts on this from a, a research or historical perspective, I, I know you find uh, Abrasax in the Greek magical papyri. I know um, he's talked about by Irenaeus, the uh, heresy hunting church father. Allegedly, uh, Abraxas was a big part of the cosmology of Basilides, the quote unquote Gnostic. Yes. Um, so, historically speaking, what can you guys weigh in on as far as? resources for for this god well that's that's what i have systematically yeah. gone through almost every in in every language the sources are very thin for for abraxas and i've looked at all of them in german and french yeah it's very very difficult it's see this this gets back in a roundabout way to what i was talking about earlier when we when you first asked about him it seems like he protects himself from being mm. known because it's incredible. And it goes back to, this is a Gnostic God. And so the core of Gnosticism and people on the internet and people listening these days need to understand this. Gnosticism isn't about, oh, you found some secret knowledge and now you're in the hip club of people who has this conspiracy knowledge. It's not like they're a religious version of political conspiracies where you found the secret info and now you're in the in and you're in the no. No. Gnosticism comes from Gnosis and Gnosis is direct experience of the supreme reality. Abrasax is a Gnostic god, therefore he must be known Gnostically. To know Gnostically is to know transcendentally, is to know through meditation well it's ex exper experientially yes i yeah. agree in this theurgy yeah it's one of the main points in my book you must be a theurgist you uh, now an interesting thing is that is absolutely true and i make that point in the last part of my book which is about abraxan theurgy and the very fact that gnosticism requires it can't be it's nothing you can study you have to be it you have to become it you have to to trans you know, transcend rational, logical thinking to approach the deity directly. So theurgy is the only way to communicate with the Braxis. But another interesting thing that I've seen, along with these synchronicities that I mentioned, that seems to be his language, is that people who I know who have become Abraxans, usually there is some very early and direct contact with the Braxis and it could be in the in the most obscure and vague way, but it completely fascinates them from an early age. Even though there's no popular culture enthusiasm about it, you know, unlike other gods and and religions, there's no there's no populist version of it to get you into it. And yet, when people are hooked into the, it seems like you know it it is. They, they are completely drawn into it very early. And I don't know if you've noticed that, but you, you're, nobody's, nobody's kind of mild about Abraxas. You're, you're either totally enthusiastic about it or you're not interested at all. And I find that to be very interesting 
aspect that you can observe in those who who deal with Abraxas? I think Nicholas put it so well. And again, I just even though I've just made this point, I want to emphasize we come to know these things through experience, through application. And sometimes that experience is the fruit of long, diligent practice where you may not feel like you're getting anywhere or you may not feel like anything's happening. But Coil, Coil, I think on one of their albums has put this saying, persistence is all. And that's the key, right? Persistence is all. Absolutely. You- Get up every day and do your spiritual practice. Don't think about it. Don't theorize it. Don't read it. And this again, to get this, this is the one of the main goals of a real teacher-student relationship is to motivate, to encourage, to set an example. Yes, you there is no possible initiatory progress without diligent persistence every day, and in fact, every minute, 24 hours a day. Initiation never stops once it begins. Uh, yeah, and I can't emphasize that enough. And it should also be understood that another thing about Abersax that is very different from the the first Demiurge is that Abersax has a very positive relationship with the divine feminine. He loves the divine feminine and is a servant of the of yes. the great the great mother, the universal right. the universal mother, you know, whether we call her Shakti or Sophia. Well, in in this case so- Sophia, Sophia which yeah which I point out in the book, again, this is a parallel between Abraxan Gnosticism, if you want to coin that phrase, and Vajrayana Buddhism, is that Sophia, which means literally wisdom, uh, is exactly the way that the Vajrayana Buddhism looks at the Dakini, or the feminine power, as being synonymous with wisdom, or sunyata, or emptiness. So Sophia and the Dakini, as it's understood, the feminine principle in Tantric Buddhism, are almost identical. So I think that's a very important point that you bring up. And you wanted to get into yoginis and Dakinis and other feminine goddesses and beings. So perhaps that's a good segue point from Sophia to Shakti. Yes, Nicholas, could you... So you have a long history with with Kali. Yes. Maybe you could speak a little bit about, especially during this time of year, it just seems so pertinent. Maybe you could speak a little bit on the nature of Kali and then the nature of the Dakini uh, in in both Indian tantrism and then Buddhist tantrism. Well, it's a, I, I when I Kali is such a deep part of my initiation. It's like she is a personal friend to me. She is still very important to my initiation. She is still a guide and a guardian at all times. And the way, I mean, I think I should talk about it in a personal way rather than an abstract, philosophical, detached manner. The way that I was, I mean, I was fascinated with Kali in my early stages of my initiation. But when I moved to London, and I was, you know, I've always been struggling between Western occultism, and then looking at traditional lineages. It was never, never one or the other. I was always there was always a battle between the two. So when I moved to London in 1983, I was very, you know, became very immersed in Western occultism at the time, which there was a sort of occult renaissance in London at that time, which I was very much caught up in. But at the same time, I became part of a Kali sect that was actually just sort of like you said, uh, they did not advertise, they did not communicate their existence, they were not looking for followers, and it was run in a very symbolic way by an Indian who operated a travel agency that, that went from, I believe, Delhi to London, it like had one plane, something like that. And he had this travel agency in London and at the travel agency, he was running a Vama, Gar- Vama Marga sect dedicated to Kali. And in a roundabout way that would be too confusing to explain, I became a part of it and was initiated into it then. And Kali, like Abraxas, Kali's direct impact on my life as a guardian, as a, as a 
guide has been direct. I mean, she has spoken to me. She and and I have described this before, I think, in an earlier episode, but I think it's worth repeating because it was quite remarkable, is that I continued to worship Kali. And people have the idea that I jumped from devil worship to Buddhism in, you know, overnight in one leap. But if you have read Demons of the Flesh, uh, uh, many people are also aware that I went through a fairly long period of the Vama Marga, of the Vedic Tantra, not not Buddhist Tantra, but the other form. And so I was very much a dedicated and devoted Shaktiite, and the idea of that is to, to form a union with Kali, to become one with her. And in the process of doing meditation to Kali, I had a meditation in which she actually came to me here in Berlin, not here in Berlin, I'm in Athens at the moment, but in Europe, she came to me in Berlin where I was meditating in the form of a totally normal Indian woman, a matronly Indian woman, nothing sinister, threatening, or apparently sacred or divine about her, two arms, and appeared in the room, a materialization as Kali, I knew that it was her, and as I've said before, she told me directly that if I become a Buddhist, it will correct something in a certain chakra that needed to be corrected. And therefore, I should absolutely become a Buddhist. So Kali, the god, one of the main goddesses in another religion, told me to, to become a Buddhist. And that's why I became a Buddhist, because of my devotion to Kali in a paradoxical way. I was so dedicated to her that I followed her instructions to become a Buddhist. And then, I think I've mentioned this before, but it also bears repeating, because it this gets into the reality of Kali, not just the fantasy of how Eastern cultures actually deal with her. Um, I took the refuge to Buddhism with a Ceylonese monk from Sri Lanka, and that was in Hinayana Buddhism before I became a Tantric Buddhist. And when I told him that Kali told me directly to become a Buddhist, he, coming from from Sri Lanka, where there's Hinduism and Buddhism coexist, not always peacefully, uh, he said, well, in that makes perfect sense, because in Sri Lanka, we know that Kali has become liberated and she has become a Buddhist protector. So that was coming from his own personal experience. And this is why you need to deal with people who who have spiritual experience and not just theoreticians. So he, a Buddhist monk, was saying, yeah, Kali has become a Buddhist. So I think that's that's the most significant thing that I can say about her in my own life is how, I mean, she has been such an incredibly important teacher and protector and guardian and guide in my life in every way. Not not at all an abstract, distant figure, but a very direct effect and influence on me. It can be said, it's said in the in, in one school that worships her that Kali is actually consciousness itself. And this is remarkable because this is exactly how Sophia is described. That the 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 poem Thunder Perfect Consciousness Perfect Mind could the, the word, mind, yeah. yeah, but but the word that is commonly translated as mind is um, can can be con- translated as consciousness as well, um, and mm-hmm. you know because we're spe- talking about Greek, which had a lot of nuance to it. And in right. Sophia, if you if you read the Gnostic book, the Trimorphic Protonoia, for instance, uh, Sophia is described in nearly identical terms of, w- with some of the more subtle descriptions of Kali, like Sophia is described as the primal creative thought that formed everything in existence. And she's described right. as pure consciousness itself and the substance of consciousness that flowed out from the Godhead. This is exactly how Kali is described in, in certain texts, like in the Kashmiri texts. So it's really remarkable, yes. you know, considering this. But if you really think about that, if Kali, the Divine Mother or or Sophia is pure consciousness, then that means we are all Sophia. 
that we are all Kali in our purest original nature, the Divine Mother. Well, that that is that again is the central point of the left hand path in the true sense in the Vama Marga and Vajrayana, is that wisdom, emptiness, which is everything, sunyata, that is all that we experience, is feminine in nature. So it is completely exactly the same message from different cultural points of view. Now, when we discuss these things, it's important because I think Western intel intellectuals approaching esoteric topics, and Jung is guilty of this, tend to look at Kali, Sophia, etc., as merely archetypes. And they're not. So there are, the, Kali exists, Sophia exists. They are not the same thing. But also, as mortals, we have to understand we are not able to comprehend the whole picture of the divine realm. So I think when we approach these, when we see these similarities between goddesses, it's very important to avoid this feminist approach to goddesses, which you see particularly in Wicca, which is one of the most pernicious forms of neo-paganism, um, that all the goddesses are just the same, that they're basically just, you know, different projections of, a, of an essential feminine being, which you would not do with male deities. It's a kind of weird sexism in, in this feminist magic. And I'm sure you know what you mean, what, what I mean, in that they'll say, you know, Isis is the same as another goddess. You know, that, that they're all interchangeable, that there's just the goddess. So in approaching that idea, well, I think it's true. I think it's important to point out Sophia and Kali are not the same being. Yeah, that's. I think that what we need to understand is when you hear that Sophia is pure consciousness or absolute consciousness, and you hear that Kali is absolute consciousness, it's talking about the root nature of these goddesses, because there is the there is the cosmic divine mother who is anterior to everything and brought everything into being from herself. And right. And the Gnostic understanding of any divine being is that those divine beings. In their true nature transcend names, forms, right. intellection, or understanding, and have to be again directly experienced. And the thing about Kali is she Kali has a personality. She has she has preferences. She has things that I mean Kali is very active. And so I, I definitely do not want to say that Kali is anyone other than Kali without Kali herself saying that. Because I don't, yeah. I only want to please her. <laughs> yes. Well, we we are we as mortals, even if we have initiatory experience, we we understand with humility that we cannot fully comprehend the divine realm. And for instance, what you're saying, you know, the name of Braxis, or more properly Abrasax, is not the name of a god. It is. It's a tool to be able to even refer to this consciousness. But that is a very important part of, of, of Abraxas, for instance, is that his name is a symbol, and it's very consciously a symbol. We do not know his name, and we do not ultimately know the true name of Kali or Sophia, because we, we're just getting a very distorted picture from our limited mortal perspective. And as you say, we have to transcend through theurgy that limited mortal perspective for direct apprehension with the divine consciousness, at which point all these names, nomenclatures, lore, mythologies become, they're just a ladder to bring us to that point. I think that is necessary to underscore. And I just want to say thank you so much, Nicholas, for your consistent eloquence on these matters. You make, and, and many of our listeners have said this, you make things that are difficult for people to understand much easier with your 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 ability to cut through straight to the heart of things like you have a sword well that that is very much what i see my job here on earth ultimately whatever the various activities worldly activities that i do they are all concerned with helping people as long as i am here in this world to to guide them to see the the, the core reality and to remove the obscurations. That, that is my particular mission. Now, before we 
wrap, though, I did want to drill down a little bit more into the nature of the Dakinis. Right. And I was hoping. Well, we also we to... also wanted to we wanted to touch on synchronicity too. So maybe we can we can get into the Dakini and then synchronicity, which is not disconnected from. I was about to as say all the of same these things. Thing. Although I'm not yeah. going to go into the details for our listeners, you and I have had synchronicities around Dakini. Right. Well, uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I think we should refer to a few of them because I think. It's very important that people understand these things we're discussing, as you have emphasized, are to be experienced. And if you are on an initiatory path, the the hallmark of it is that you will have these experiences. And if you're if you're not having them, then you are somehow not on a spiritual path. So I think it's important to discuss our own quote real life experiences with these things. But the Dakini is a very mysterious and vast topic. We've touched on it a little bit, but the Dakini is the, it can, it can be a Dakini can be a female teacher and an inherit an incarnate human teacher can be referred to as a Dakini of a very high level. There are worldly Dakinis that can appear that, that are not spiritually enlightened, but that can be helpful spiritual guides they are referred to as worldly dakinis there are wisdom dakinis that appear in the life of an initiate when we need her to appear and there are several tantric masters particularly if they were given to overly linear intellectual rational scholarship a dakini appeared to shock them to wake them up dakinis are playful in the way that they emerge they, very often they appear to spiritual students or searchers who are being too earnest or too joyless in their approach to initiation. And the Dakini is a dancer. She is wild. She meet, her name means sky dancer. So she, she, and she has something of the quality that Hinduism refers to in the, in the gods of Leela, the playfulness of the gods. The Dakini is a trickster. The Dakini, I mentioned that there's a connection with synchronicity in that one of the ways you know you are dealing with the Dakini is she leaves messages for you that are not completely decipherable or understandable. And I mean this literally. I and another practitioner did practice somewhere in Berlin for a long time. And for a certain period, literal little pieces of paper that were formed on some kind of material that did not seem identifiable. It wasn't exactly paper. It wasn't exactly silk. Some sort of organic material would appear near the altar that we had, and there would be messages on it. And as try, try as hard as we would to keep these things, they would dissolve. And this is a traditional Dakini message. And sometimes messages are left in an indecipherable language. And just the appearance of these metaphysical messages are telling you that she's there. And that that's a very real phenomenon. So that's, I, I think maybe I could end on the Dakini with one experience that was related to me by a, a Sakya Lama, a Tulku, a guru, here in Berlin, one of my very earliest teachers. And he was, I believe, taking a retreat in Dharamsala, I'm pretty sure, the home of the Dalai Lama. And he, after the retreat, he went out to a, a traditional marketplace where food and spices and clothing were sold. And he had just been through a very extensive meditation retreat. And he saw at one of the tents someone selling that appeared to be textiles very beautifully colored silk but it and he noticed it because it was incredibly shiny and luminescent there was something otherworldly about this material that this woman was selling and he looked he just and he was in a very open and sensitive mood because he had been meditating for a long time in retreat so going out into the everyday bustle of, of an Indian market was like a, a shock. 
So this very bright colors of the fabric attracted him to it. And he went up to ask about what material this is. And there was, as he described it, a, a very beautiful young woman with very glossy black hair that was almost blue, he recalled. And then she smiled at him when she was saying what the material. And he said, I believe he said that he didn't quite understand her accent because it didn't seem, he couldn't quite comprehend what language she was speaking. And when she smiled, she had fangs, which is the traditional way that the mouth of the Dakini is presented. She had very sharp fangs. Like you can see if you Google Vajrayogini, you'll see she has fangs. And that her, a third eye appeared very subtly, just sort of materialized, morphed in her forehead, winked, and then disappeared. And her fangs disappeared. But just for a moment, he saw that she was a Dakini. And this, you know, this happened in the 20th century, not that long ago. So the Dakini appears when you need her to appear. And there is no doubt of, of the uncanny presence of this supernatural being that is a guide who breaks through when there's obstacles in our spiritual progress. She will appear to you. So I think that's, that's I like to keep things to a real life, everyday experiential context. So that, that I think is a very significant way to describe the mystery and the playfulness and how the Dakini doesn't explain why she's appearing to you. She just shows you, I'm here. And that can awaken you to motivate you to deeper spiritual practice. Interesting, Nicholas. On the on the other side of things, um, the Dakini, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, from my understanding, were also known to be flesh-eating de- and demon-like Um and that they would they would eat the flesh of humans and they would consume humans and I believe in a sutra I can't recall which sutra that the Mahavirachana Buddha uh, disguised himself as uh, Mahakala and he consumed the Dakini and then eventually let them free under the with under the condition that they they stop consuming human flesh. How do you see the balance there between those two kind of perspectives? Right, right. There, yes, there are, there are many uh, folk tales and legends in tantric Buddhist yeah. lore about a great master taming. Now, th- this is something I brought up briefly before. These vampiric, cannibalistic, demonic dakinis are what referred to as worldly ah, dakinis. Got it. So, so they're. Actually, in Islam, you have benevolent jinn and malevolent mm-hmm. jinn. There's even Christian jinn. So in in authentic spiritual traditions, these supernatural, again, not a good word, but the one that we have that is perhaps mm-hmm. best suited, um, there can be, as with elves in, Kel- in Celtic mythology, they can be benevolent, they could seem tricky, but they could be helping you. They could seem helpful, and they could turn out to be utterly malevolent, trying to mm-hmm. destroy you. So Dakinis are very tricky. They they always appear in a kind of demonic, sinister appearance, like Kali, like Vajrayogini. But there's a difference between the worldly Dakini that is a kind of vampiric ghoul mm-hmm. uh, or, or the wisdom Dakini, which is their to awaken you and to lead you in a shocking and sometimes mischievous or, or even radically disturbing way back onto the initiatory path. But there are many examples of, uh, of spiritual masters taming or converting worldly Dakinis to become wisdom Dakinis. So that's, that's the differentiation there. Very nicely put. I just want to touch one last thing really quickly. And that's just that we're in a very powerful shift right now in terms of the eclipse cycles. Um, We're coming to the end of a long two or three year eclipse cycle on uh, the Scorpio axis and a new one on the Libra axis is occurring. And 
Uh, I think, Nicholas, you've mentioned before that's, that eclipses are an excellent time for spiritual practice. Absolutely, because during an eclipse, your karmic, the karmic weight of your words, your thoughts, and your actions are magnified tremendously, sometimes by millions of times. So an eclipse is a very rare opportunity to really focus on your spiritual practice, and especially the clarification of negative karma. If you are trying to heal somebody, then put all of your energy into that. If you have a spiritual path, the eclipse is the time to really dedicate yourself to it, rededicate yourself in the true sense of religare, religion, to to bind into into your tradition and into your practice. So you, all of all of your positive karmic actions during an eclipse will be magnified tremendously. So try to avoid them and try to develop virtues and positive, auspicious karmic habits that will then develop tremendously. So yes, that's very good that you pointed that out. And again, we live in the real world. These things have true application to our everyday life. So we need... We need not to let this become an abstract intellectual study, but something that actually benefits and, and enriches our everyday life. So that's why I, I try to keep referring to real life references and what's really happening. So your mention of the eclipse is very timely. Well, Nicholas, we want to thank you again. This has always been a wonderful tradition with you. And... We're grateful for it. It's it's become our uh, a Halloween necessity to have the mysterious Mr. Shrek on the show. Now I know you're probably on all kinds of classified assignments that you can't disclose to us private, it, privately or publicly, but only what, only on the deepest inner plane. <laughs> <laughs> but what can you disclose about what you're doing right now, where people can contact you, and uh, you know? What help you can afford others on the spiritual path? I, I think they can easily figure out how to contact me with the slightest bit of online research, for one. If they're serious about doing it, they can put a little effort into it, as many people do. Other than that, top secret, I cannot refer to even one of the confidential missions <laughs> I'm on. It's It's for your eyes only. But the James Bond theme is playing here in Greece. That's all I can tell you. I will I will be going to Paris next week. And it's funny you say all that because it's totally true. What I'm doing in Paris will touch on all of those things. And it is better that I don't speak about it. So that was a synchronicity because you didn't know you were actually getting a bit of a premonition there. Because what I'm doing in Paris will touch directly on everything you just said in jest. But this is the playfulness of the universe, is that what we say in jest is very often true. So aside from the secret spy mission that we shouldn't be talking about any longer. Um, right. What's the timeline for this Abraxas book? Well, I've been working on it for two years to make sure that it's absolutely definitive and and every time i think that it's finished i find a new unbelievable mm. like i looked into free uh, one thing that i i didn't even know about was free was that freemasonry has a braxis as a part of it in a way that i wasn't fully aware of and that there's a whole secret lore and even conspiracy theories about the connection of a braxis mm. to that getting into some of the traditional a lot of people don't realize that the Abraxan idea to Basilides was actually believed to have been taught by the apostles of Christ. So then I had to look into, well, is Abraxas really a taboo, forbidden, alternate version, or is it the real Christianity? Mm. And that's something that Janice, I'm sure, could comment on. So, Oh, I could yeah, wax um, on that for years. So well, we know, oh, we know. Right. right. <laughs> Or or aeons <laughs> rather than <laughs> yeah. So those are some of the things that I looked into recently. That, but it will definitely come out early next year. And I met the publisher from Anya Books in Sweden. He actually attended 
the lecture that I gave, right. which I will I have put up the introduction to that on my Instagram and Facebook page, but I will be putting up the entire lecture which I gave in Stockholm, which was presented by Christian Olsen uh, in Stockholm. So I will, I'll be putting up that Abraxas lecture, which is the first chapter of the book, actually, very soon. So thank you, gentlemen, for inviting me. I wish everyone a happy Halloween. And from the underworld of Greece, the greetings of Pluto and Eridice and Orpheus in the underworld. Thank you, Nicholas. And as always, Nicholas, thank you and all the best to you and your, your work. Thank you and all the best to you. We magicians and fools will speak again. For my ghouls and goblins out there, that was Nicholas Dracula Shrek on our perennial Halloween installment of the Magician and the Fool podcast. Thank you for listening. We love having Nicholas on. He's a wealth of knowledge. He's also actually a very funny person, very smart, witty, and has a real spiritual message to share that we support very strongly. And um, teacher, musician, poet, researcher, scholar, and of course, international spy, which I was not supposed to divulge. <laughs> yeah, and he does come across you know, part of his um, persona, he's an entertainer, but he does have a kind of a hard outer shell um, and this kind of scary vampiric, you know, character, but he's actually a very uh, kind and compassionate guy, not only behind the scenes, but it, I think it comes through in his message as well. So um, always controversial. I'm sure there will pe be people that um, find issues with this interview just you know we don't really oh yeah i mean the last time last time nicholas was on i actually had people coming to my house trying to fight me right and we we support that if you want to go to <laughs> janice's house and fight him that's totally fine in fact if anybody wants my address just ma message a magician and the fool podcast so i'll make sure to be home and we can right have yeah. some holiday fun Right. So please do that. All right. Seriously, though, let's let's uh, thank you, Nicholas, and let's uh, move on to the book review. What do you got? Yeah, thanks, Nicholas. So the book I have today is um, really a work of it's very clear that this publication is a labor of love. OK, if for you at home, if you're doing the drink, the magician and the full drinking game, Janice said labor of love. So you could take a shot now. OK, go. <laughs> This is published by Anathema, and it is Greg Kaminsky's Celestial Intelligences. The subtitle is Angelology, Kabbalah, and Gnosis, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola's Quest for the Perennial Philosophy. And this just came out in 2023. It tells the story of uh, Pico and his deep knowledge of Kabbalah to the point that he adapted it for Jewish for Christian mysticism. Um, many of you may be familiar with, you know, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, Giordano Bruno, uh, to a lesser extent, Johann Reuchlin. Uh, but these Renaissance polymath mages, uh, many of them also worked on a synthesis of um, Hebraic Kabbalah and, and mystical Christianity. And this, this charts the trajectory of Pico's particular iteration of this, especially his ideas about the angelic hierarchies laid out in his book, Oration on the Dignity of Man, and his other book, 900 Theses. Greg, he traces the outlines of a spiritual path, which is expressed through Pico, by Pico through these writings, with the idea to lead a human being from self-knowledge, to divine union. And so this book is, the illustrations are beautiful too. Uh, red, black, and white illustrations. It goes through uh, the, you know, angelic orders, angels as intelligences, Kabbalistic 
influences on Pico, mystical approaches to union with the divine, the continuation of wisdom and tradition, and even more uh, uh, for the for those people that are especially interested in the sort of meta archangel Metatron, and there's even a chapter in there on Metatron and the scapegoat uh, Azazel. So it's a nice little book. It is it's really a gem of intellectual effort, and I have to applaud Mr. Kaminsky for his work. It's very high quality material. It's not a huge book. It is a prox. It is 173 pages, but every page is clear and lucid, but also very intelligently written. And for anyone interested in these subjects, even historically, it's 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 a very interesting historical book. I, I think he did a wonderful job drawing together these different threads and in helping us to understand Pico's particular perspective on these matters and his agenda and the way that he the way that he articulated the trajectory and um I really recommend it. I think it's very good. You know, Anathema has really hit it out of the ballpark with a few things in the past few years. I mean, Shani Oates's books are some of the best books out there on the subjects that she writes on and they publish her. And this book by Greg Kaminsky is another just fantastic book. It is not for the dilettante. It's not for, it's not for the Insta witch. It's for the very serious esotericist and historian, I think. I think this is for the folks out there who are really deep, knee deep in the trenches, rather than the people who are um, involved in the fashion show. And that's all, folks. Name of the book again. The name of the book is Celestial Intelligences: Angelology, Kabbalah, and Gnosis. Giovanni Pico della Mirandola's Quest for the Perennial Philosophy. It's by Greg Kaminsky, and the. Wonderful illustrations and diagrams are by the very talented Joseph Uccello. All right. Great. Thank you for that. Um, We're going to keep it short today. Find us in all the places. Subscribe, like, comment, uh, go to Janice's house and fight him. And uh, (laughs) We'll see you next time. I'm here for you folks. Get ready. Um, And also, you guys know, I never say these kinds of things, but it is true. Podcasts take time, they take energy, and they take financial investment. So I just wanted to personally give a big thank you to those people who do support us. It means a lot. Uh, It's thanks to you that we're able to keep the lights on. And given the fact that at this point, we literally have listeners around the entire world, we are humbled by that. and, And we're grateful for it because that means we're able to reach that many more people with quality information and and bridge the gap of cultures with genuine knowledge.